Hello and welcome. In this video, we're going to get Python installed on our computers, uh, and I just want to walk you through that process in case you don't have that there, uh, just to make sure everybody is on the same page. So if we go to our web browser and we simply just type in Python up in the uh, search bar, um, probably the first link here, uh, python.org, we're going to click Downloads. Uh, and as of the time of recording this video, the current version of Python is Python version 3.10.6. Uh, so I'm going to click the Download button, and that's going to download an exe for me right here. Um, so I'll click that to open this up and pretty much we're going to leave everything the same except I'm going to make a special note here to check the box that says add Python 3.10 uh, to our system path variable and now that's that 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 is there I'm just going to do the uh, the default install so I'll click install now um, allow this to save changes uh, and that's going to go through and do its installation here uh, and I will pause the video uh, and come back when it's done Okay, so it looks like that has uh, fully installed here. Uh, so I'm just gonna close out here and let's just verify it. A couple of ways we can verify it. Uh, first, if I open up a command line or a PowerShell, if I simply type in the word Python here, I should be given the uh, Python interpreter so I can do things like, you know, print hello world and that should work fine. Awesome, so Python is installed and it gives us our version 3.10.6. Uh, and then, you know, just one more thing here. If you go to your programs, if you search, um, idle or IDLE. Um, this is like the, um, you know, installed Python um, IDE that's included here. So this is installed here. And again, we can type things, you know, like print hello world, uh, and that should work out fine. Um, you know, and you can create new files and then write your scripts and then save them and run them. Um, we're going to use a different IDE uh, here in this video. There's nothing wrong with idle. Um, I just like um, some other options a little bit better. And so we'll see how to install those in our next video. I'll see you then. Okay, in our last video, we installed Python, uh, got that set up on our computer. So in this video, we're going to install um, the IDE that I'm going to use um, for all of the videos here. Of course, you can use whatever IDE you want. Um, I just like to use uh, Microsoft Visual Studio Code or VS Code. So I'm going to just type into Google Microsoft Visual Studio Code, uh, and I'll click the download link right here for us. Uh, and that'll bring me to the option to download it for whatever specific platform I'm on. So I'm on Windows, so I'll click download here. Uh, and and that should launch the download. We'll download that exe, uh, and then once it's downloaded, we'll launch it and just look at some of the um, options we have for uh, configuration um, of the install. All right, so just a couple seconds left. All right, so it looks like that exe has downloaded. I'll click it to launch it, and uh, we'll read. We should probably read through this agreement, and we'll speed read it and click accept. <laughs> like we do for most of those things. Um, I think the default folder is perfectly fine here and we'll create a shortcut, great. Um, here I'm going to leave everything the same. I'm going to definitely make sure I add um, this to our path variable and so I'll click next and I will click install. All right, so I'm going to let it do, uh, do its thing. I'll pause the video and unpause it when the install is complete. Okay, so our download has completed. Uh, so I'm just going to click finish here and that should launch uh, VS Code for us. All right, perfect. So uh, here we are. Um, one of the first things that we're going to do is I'll just close this tab. Over here on the left, we have like our file explorer and search. Uh, right here at the bottom, we have some extensions. We're going to go to our extensions. Um, you may have some pre-installed. You may not. Um, but the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to search the extension marketplace. I'm going to search for Python. Uh, and this first one that comes up here, um, we're going to install uh, Python. It's got Right now it's got 61.6 uh, .6 million uh, downloads. That's crazy. So I'll click install here. This will install uh, a Python extension for us so that we can bring in that functionality into uh, VS Code. Um, so hopefully that won't take too long. And then what we'll do is we'll just create a new file um, to try to verify that everything is working properly. All right, so this is installing. Why don't I pause the video and uh, we'll come back when that's done. Okay, perfect. So uh, it looks like that is installed. So if I just click, uh, if I, you know, remove this and I look at what I have installed, you can see it installed Python and uh, PyLance for me. So now I'm just going to create, come over here, I'm going to do a new file and we'll select it to be a Python file. All right. Um, 
says Python is not installed. That might just be because I had to restart my computer and I didn't do it. We'll, we'll, we'll check that. First thing that I'm going to do is I'm just going to save this file. Uh, I'm just going to save it to my desktop for right now. I'll call it test.py. I'll give it the .py Python extension. If I want to get rid of my extensions here, I just simply click that box to get full screen. Uh, and here we'll do print hello world. And so let's see if this runs. So we'll do run uh, and we'll run without debugging. You can do that with control F5 if you like. Uh, and right down here in the terminal, it looks like uh, everything is working out nicely. So we're we're printing hello world uh, to our terminal here. So our IDE uh, VS Code is installed and we are good to go. Uh, so I will see you in our next video. Hello. In this video, I just want to give a brief introduction to some of the networking concepts that we're going to sort of focus on um, through the scope of these videos. Um, so I want everybody to have just a firm understanding of some of the basics before we dive into writing some Python network applications with sockets. So we have to know a little bit about you know, the internet. And so what exactly is the internet? Well, we can say the internet's a global network of billions of electronic devices um, all connected together. Essentially, it's one huge network that is made up of various smaller networks, right? If you think about it, at your house, you probably have your own network, your Wi-Fi network maybe you've connected to, and your neighbor has a Wi-Fi network, and your other neighbor has a Wi-Fi network, and your work has a network, and your maybe your school has a network, and all these networks come together to create the internet. Now, all of the machines on the internet are either what we call servers or clients. So the machines that provide services to other machines, these are known as servers. And the machines that are used to connect to those servers are clients. So like your laptop um, or your computer at your house that you use to like get on the internet and Google things, that is going to be a client. And when you are Googling something and you're asking for information, what you're doing is you are connecting to a Google server somewhere. And so a couple of really important questions that I think are going to drive the focus of these videos here is how do we distinguish one computer or device from another on a network? And how do we actually send information from one computer or device to another over, um, over a given network? And so these are the questions that are going to drive our discussion. So first, let's talk about a couple of different types of networks. Because um, we said the internet's uh, kind of one giant network that's made up of lots of smaller networks. So the giant network we can refer to as a WAN, or a wide area network. It's a group of computers that span across a large scale uh, geographic area, making what essentially is a large scale network. And the internet is a great example of a WAN, because it spans uh, you know, the whole globe. Uh, opposite of this is what we would call a LAN or a local area network. This is a group of computers connected in a limited geographic area making a much smaller scale network. So your home network that you connect to at your house or maybe your network at your school is a great example of a LAN or local area network. Now, if you are connected to the internet at your home, we said the internet is a wide area network. In order to get on that wide area network, you are most likely paying an internet service provider for what's known as a public IP address. This is a unique address on the internet, and your router or modem that connects you to the internet is the only device on the internet with this public IP address. It has to be unique. Now, inside of your home, your computer uh, most likely has uh, received what's known as a local IP address from your router. Now, inside your home, this is a unique IP address. So like your computer versus your, maybe, you know, your so another family member's computer versus your cell phone versus your smart TV. Inside your house, they will all have unique local IP addresses. However, on other networks or LANs, because we're inside of a home network now, there can be other devices that have those same local IP addresses. So maybe on your neighbor's network, there is their computer that has the exact same local IP address as your computer. It doesn't matter because you're on different LANs here. Now, uh, an important thing that we have to state is that, you know, how do we determine these addresses? Well, an internet protocol address or IP address is essentially the network address for your computer. So the internet, the WAN, or your router, uh, a LAN, knows where to send data essentially. So here's a couple of examples. Like here's a good example of a public IP address, 18.25.15.99. And you can actually 
type in public IP addresses and determine where that IP address is originated from. So I did that for this one, and this is uh, coming from Cambridge, Massachusetts. It's well known. Now, here is a local IP address. This is my house, um, and this is my laptop right now, 192.168.1.7. This is my local address. And so you have no idea where I am right now uh, just by looking at my local address because it's kind of locked off from the internet. Now, the most common type of IP address is the IPv4, or Internet Protocol version 4 uh, address. And IPv4 addresses consist of four numbers uh, grouped together, ranging from 0 to 255. So you see right here we have 192, 168, 1, and 7. Here you have 18, 25, 15, and 99. So we're following the Internet Protocol version 4, um, so IPv4 um, protocol. And we need a protocol to give a common agreement on how information will be shared and expressed. So everything that we do in this course, we're going to use IPv4. There's another protocol called IPv6, which is a little bit more advanced, but for our purposes and mainly for the purposes of it, everybody else everyone's a lot of people are still just using IPv4 so how can you find your own IP address so this is an important thing we're gonna have to do so you're gonna want to open up you can open up a terminal or a CMD or a PowerShell depending on what device you're on or operating system and in Windows it's as simple as typing IP config and I have a Windows computer so we're gonna do that um, shortly on Linux, you can type IP space A, or this, um, if you have what's called the INET, I think it's INET tools packages installed, you can type IF config. This used to be the primary way, but I think they're moving away from it and going to IP A. Uh, on Mac, I'm not sure if this works. I, I don't have a Mac, I've never tested it, um, but um, I Google searched it, and I, you can type IP config, get IF ADDR, so get interface address, and then EN0 would be the name of the first interface that's on your device. You might have to to change this to like EN1, EN2, and when I say interface, I mean like the network interface, the thing that's connecting to the computer. So I'm just going to back out a full screen here, and I'm going to open up a PowerShell. Uh, and so here is my PowerShell, and I'm on Windows. So if I want to see my current IP address, I simply just type IP config. And if we look here, we get a lot of information. So um, I am going to look, I'm connected uh, via Wi-Fi right here. So I'm going to look at my wireless adapter. So here's my Wi-Fi adapter. And we get some nice uh, in information. Here is my IPv4 address. If you notice, it is 192.168.1.7. Now, we... Uh, in my house, I've got lots of devices connected to my, my Wi-Fi. And uh, in my house, my laptop right here is the only one that is 192.168.1.7. So I have my cell phone uh, right next to me. What might its IP address be if it's connected to the same network? Well, I mean, I guess you could say it could be any number, but there's an important thing right here called the subnet mask. And we're not really going to use subnet masks, but I figured we would just talk about it. The subnet mask kind of tells you what the actual network address is. So if you look here in my subnet mask, I have 255.255.255.0. It's four numbers again. And anywhere you have a 255, what that means is in your network address, that number has to be the same. So I've got a 255 here in the first number. So that means in my network address, the first number has to be the same. I've got a 255 as my second number. So in my network address, this number has to be the same. A 255 here is my third number. So in my network address, that number has to be the same. Here I have a zero. So what that tells me is my last number of my network address can vary. So anything on my local network would have the IP address of 192.168.1 dot something else so the seven will vary so maybe my cell phone is 192.168.1.8 or dot nine or dot ten or dot eleven now we have one more really important IP address right here and it's our default gateway essentially this is going to be the local IP address of your um, router or modem so if you look here we have 192.168.1 the network address has to be the same here we've already indicated that and then typically your router or modem sits at dot one on the network connection so my router's IP here is 192.168.1 and my computer's local IP is 192.168.1.7 now be careful these are what I'm calling my uh, local IP address, right? These are my local IP addresses, not my public IP address. So when I want to communicate, I connect to my router, and my router actually has a public IP address that it uses to get to the internet. It gets information from the internet, the internet sends it back to my router, and then my router sends it back to my local machine right here at this address.
So let's kind of maybe visualize this. I have a nice little graphic here that I think will maybe help explain this. So imagine here, um, I imagine everything on this side of this line is, is a house on a, on a LAN, okay, on a local area network, and everything above this line is another LAN. And so we've got a couple of routers here that are connecting to the internet. Notice that the router is on the LAN, okay, it's on the local side, but it's also on the public side. It's connected to the internet in both cases. So let's pretend this is my house. So on my local network, my router has an IP of 192.168.1.1. That's our local IP address. And that router can send information to all of the different computers connected to it. And these computers have local IP addresses, 192.168.1.14.7.4.13.34. On my local area network, each IP is unique. So that looks perfect. So if computer two wants to talk to computer one, computer two sends some information to the router with the IP address of who we want to talk to and the router routes it to this computer. Everything looks great. Look at my friend's house. So this is my friend's house. We've got another uh, local area network, same IP address, 192.168.1.1. That's absolutely fine because my LAN up here and my LAN down here are isolated. And so we've got a couple of devices connected to this local area network, 192.168.1.5, 192.168.1.14. On this LAN, those IP addresses are unique. It doesn't matter that this local area, uh, this local IP and this local IP are the same because they're on different LANs. Note though, the router also has a public IP address, 77.45.82.17 or 77.45.19.16. These are unique on the internet. So let's say computer two on this LAN wants to talk to this computer on this LAN. How's it going to do it? Well, it sends its information to the router. The router then sends it to the internet which sends it to a specific router, which then forwards it over to this machine. And this is kind of how our public and, uh, and, and local IP addresses sort of work. And we're going to get more into this later on in the course. There's, there's a lot more to this. There's certain things that we might have to do, like set up static IP addresses or enable what is known as port forwarding. You might be looking here, and I've got a little star here that says, our machine running our server on port 12345. So we're going to have to talk a little bit about what exactly our these port numbers are port addresses. And so let's let's head to that right now. So if you think of an IP address as the address of your computer on a given network, a port address is the address that a specific application or service runs on that given computer. So like I'm just going to come back here. Like imagine computer 2. The router is going to be sending a lot of information to computer 2. Maybe the router is sending like web traffic uh, to computer 2 for a bunch of different websites or maybe it's going to be sending um, um, email information or maybe it's sending um, like uh, something known as file transfer protocol like we're gonna be sending lots of different information to the computer the computer has to like sort through it so how does it sort through it well it has port addresses and each port um, address on a computer there's certain information running so some common ports and services like port 21 typically runs what is called file transfer protocol uh, FTP port 22 to typically runs uh, SSH or Secure Shell. Port 25 is SMTP, Simple Mail Transfer Protocol. Port 80 and Port 443, these are for web traffic. HTTP uh, or HTTPS, Hypertext Transfer Protocol, and then Hypertext Transfer Protocol Secure. So when your router is trying to send information, whether it's web traffic or an FTP request, it sends them to your specific computer, the IP address, but then it sends it to a specific port where we know a service is running. So your router may receive data, you know, to send to your computer from a website or for a file transfer protocol using FTP, it will send it both to the respective IP address, but the web uh, traffic will go to port 80 or port 443, while the FTP request will go to port 21. So let's just take a quick look at uh, some of our services that are currently running on my machine in my PowerShell using a command netstat uh, tac na. So if I open up a PowerShell, I can type um, Netstat. If I just type netstat, I think it's going to give me a running list of some of the things that are connected. And right now, I don't really have anything uh, connected. Um, here we go, 192.168.1.7, okay, so that's my local IP address, is currently connected to 52.159.127.243, and it says it's HTTPS traffic. So this is not on my local network. This is probably on, like, some uh, public IP, and this is probably my Google Drive that I have open right here, and it's HTTPS, uh, you know, an HTTP TPS connection, and if you look here, I've got the lock. If I click here, it says connection is secure, so I think that, I, that is probably my HTTPS right here. So let's 
cancel this because I want to see some of the port services. So to cancel inside of a terminal, you just hit Control, Control X, Control C, Control C. There we go. And so now I'll type netstat tac n a. And so here we get a long list of all of the things that are currently running. And so if you look here. Um, you notice there's protocol, local address, foreign address, and then the state. And so I'm just going to note here for the protocol, there's uh, listed, we have TCP, and then we have uh, some UDP stuff going on here. So we're going to talk a little bit in a, a second about TCP and UDP, but let's just note like some of these connections that are happening right in here. And so if you look, we have a TCP connection on my current address 192.168.1.7 and I'm opening up a port for this connection. It's port uh, 49,438. And then our foreign address, what are we connecting to? We're connecting to 52.159.127.243 at port 443. Port 443, we said, is hypertext transfer protocol secure. So this is web traffic. And if you notice the state, it says a connection is established. So I've an established connection between these two um, ports, and we can send information back and forth. And that's essentially what we are going to be trying to do throughout this scope of these videos coming up. Uh, if you know, in the state, we've got different states. We've got a listening state, maybe like, you know, we're just listening for an incoming connection, but there is no connection. We have an established connection. We have a closed connection, all for TCP. And then if you notice down here under UDP, if you look here, none of that information is present, almost as if UDP doesn't really care to be listening for connections or um, making connections. And so just kind of a little cool command here, you can look at some of the things that you have going on with Netstat. So let's wrap this up and just quickly talk a little bit more about some of these connections. So when we make a connection at a specific port, the service that's running on that port typically has to choose some sort of uh, protocol for communication. And the two primary ones are known as transmission control protocol or user datagram protocol, TCP and UDP. And a big distinction here is that TCP is a connection-based protocol. A connection has to be made before any data can be sent. And we sort of saw that when we looked at my Netstat output, we saw that there was, you know, a listening state or an established state. Once the connection is established, then data can be sent. And so it's, TCP is typically used to send, uh, you know, reliable, to create a reliable error-free connection. It's going to ensure that all data that was sent is actually received and it keeps track and organizes all of the, the data packets that are sent. UDP, on the other hand, is what's known as a connectionless protocol. So no connection has to be made before sending data, right? On my Netstat output, we didn't see anything about our, our connection status. UDP tends to be faster because no connections required, but you may not receive the data in the order that you sent it, and you could actually have missing data. So UDP, TCP is like very secure, right? Or not secure, I shouldn't say secure, but it's more like reliable. Like we establish a connection, we make sure that there's a connection, we send packets of information, we wait for confirmation that the packets were received, and we continue on. UDP is like less reliable. UDP really doesn't care. UDP is just like, hey, I'm going to start sending information out and hopefully it gets to where it needs to go. Now, what exactly is a socket? Because our whole goal here is to write programs, uh, Python networking applications using sockets. And so we can define a socket as a one as one endpoint of a two-way communication channel between two programs that are running on a network. So when we create sockets, we have to specify the internet protocol and the communication protocol that the socket will use. So there has to be some agreement of how the information is going to be sent. And so imagine if we create an IPv4 TCP socket. So what we'll do is we'll have one socket, our server, essentially listening for incoming connections at a specific location. The location being their IP address and a specific port address. Then another socket, the client, will connect to that specific IP port address to open up a line of communication. So a connection will be made using the IPv4 TCP socket. In contrast, if we create an IPv4 UDP socket, what we'll do is we'll just create the sockets on both ends and we'll just start simply sending information back and forth to a given location without any connection. So if we know the IP address and the port address our server is running on, we're not going to connect to it. We're just going to sending information to it in hopes that it gets there. So in the next couple of videos, what we'll do is we'll start looking at the socket module for Python and how we go about creating IPv4 TCP sockets and IPv4 UDP sockets and some of their similarities and some of their differences. Um, so hopefully this was a good like introduction to some of these concepts of um, 
you know, LANs and WANs and IP addresses and port addresses and TCP and UDP. There's really so much more that we could talk about in regards to this, but I just wanted to give a quick uh, a refresher here so everybody's at the same baseline as we move forward into our next videos. So I will see you then. Hello and welcome back. Now that we know some of the fundamentals of networking and sockets, we are going to begin working on creating a server side script for some communication using the sockets module. Um, so I'm going to start here by opening up a new file. Uh, so file, new file, we'll click a Python file and I'll just put a comment up here. I'll say TCP server side uh, and I'm going to save this. So I'm going to go to file, uh, save as, of course you can hit control uh, S to save and I'm going to save it in my uh, dedicated directory which was on my desktop and inside my folder Poth uh, Python socket examples I'm going to create another directory. So new uh, folder and we'll just call this one, we'll call it socket intro. Uh, and the reason why we're going to have subdirectories here is we're going to have a lot of different projects where we have a server.py uh, script and then a client.py script and we want them uh, you know to only correspond to each other. So we're going to save this one inside of this subdirectory and I'll just call it simply uh, I'll call it tcp underscore server. Okay, so perfect. Uh, so now that that's saved here, the next thing I'm going to do is I think it might just help you all, uh, depending on the device that you're watching. I'm going to go to File, Preferences, and Settings, and I'm going to up the font size here. Um, I have it set to 14 right now. Why don't I bring it up to 20? Uh, it might just make things seem a little bit bigger, and I wanted to show you that in case you were interested in increasing your font size as well. Okay, so the first thing that we're going to have to do is we're going to have to import the socket module, which comes uh, predefined or pre-installed here in Python. So I'm going to just use an import statement and I'll import uh, socket. So now with the socket module loaded, we can create a brand new socket. And since this is going to be the server side, I'm going to name my socket server socket as it's going to serve as the server in my communication channel. Essentially the thing that is always going to be listening for incoming connections. Now, uh, so let me, let me name that. I'll say, name it server socket. Now when we name or uh, when we create our, our server side socket, we have to uh, be specific with what internet protocol and what communication protocol we're going to be using. So we said for our purposes um, we're going to be using uh, IPv4 and mostly TCP. We'll do a little bit of UDP uh, coming up here in the future. Um, so to do that, there's a specific way that we can uh, uh, name those things here uh, in Python. So IPv4 is going to be referenced as address family INET or essentially AFI net. Uh, and then TCP is going to be referenced as sock stream. So I'm going to put a comment here. I just think it's going to help us in the future. I'm going to say create a server side socket using IPv4. And that is going to be AF underscore INET and TCP, uh, and that is going to be sock underscore stream. All right, so let's see how we do this. We, we've named our socket server socket. To create this socket, I'm going to call the socket module, uh, and then I'm going to call the socket method. And so that's going to create our socket. So here I'm calling the module that we just imported, and here I'm calling the socket method. Now inside of here, I have to pass a, uh, a, a I have to pass that information. What internet protocol we're going to use? We're going to use um, IPv4. So I'm going to call socket dot AFI net. So there's our IPv4 uh, internet protocol. And now I have to pass in TCP protocol. So I'll do socket dot sock underscore stream. All right, perfect. And so that is going to create our uh, socket for us. So now that our server socket is created, we have to do something very important here. Since this is our server side, um, essentially the thing that is always going to be listening for incoming connections, we have to bind or essentially attach our socket to a given location, a specific location where the sh socket should be listening for incoming connections. Now, uh, this location has to be given as a tuple uh, with two pieces of information, the IP address and then the port address of that desired location. Um, so we want our IP address to essentially be the IP address of our current machine. And so we could just look it up. So like if I open up a, a PowerShell here, and I think in Windows it's IP config. Yeah, IP config, perfect. So if you look down here, here's my IPv4 address, 192.168.1.7. And I could just hard code that in as the IP address. But the problem is, is if I go to a new, um, let's say a, a new Wi-Fi network, or maybe my router is going to assign new IPs if I shut my computer down, uh, that can change. And so we don't really want to hard code that in, but instead, we want to uh, 
get the IP address dynamically using the sockets module. So uh, let's see how we might actually do that. So I'll put a comment here and we'll say, see how to get uh, IP address dynamically rather than hard coding it. Uh, and so we're going to do this a couple of different ways. So we're going to we're going to print some information to the screen here. First, I can get the host name of my machine by calling socket.gethostname. All right, and I'll put a little comment here that this is going to be my host name. And so if I run this now, what we should see is the name of my machine. Uh, and the name of my machine is Spectre Tech Aramo. So Spectre is the brand of the of HP laptop I have. I have an HP Spectre laptop, and then Aramo is my last name. So now that I have this host name, using that host name, I can get the IP address of that specific host name. So to do that, and we'll print this to the screen just to verify it, I'm going to use socket.gethostbyName. So we're going to get the host uh, that has a specific name. What name? Well, we're going to get the name by calling socket.gethostName. So we're kind of having you know these two methods nested inside of each other, and so this is going to give us you know Spectre Tac Armo, and then we're going to get the IP address of the computer that has the host name Spectre dot Armo or Spectre Tac Armo. So I'll say IP of the given host name, and so let's see if we run this now. Do we? get our IP address uh, and we get it right here 192.168.1.7 so if my IP address were to change uh, I don't have to come back in here and then you know uh, adjust the code accordingly uh, perfect so now that we have our IP address we just have to pick a, a port address or a port address to run the server on and so I'll choose um, like a high numbered port to ensure that there isn't something already running running on the chosen port you know most lowered ports are reserved for well-known services or programs so I'll use uh, just an arbitrary port. I'll do one, two, three, four, five. All right, so let's set this up. So we're going to put a comment here. Uh, we'll say bind our new socket to a tuple, and that tuple is going to be IP address and port address. All right, so we'll call our socket, server socket, and then we will call the dot bind method. And so this is what's gonna um, essentially attach it to a specific location where it's always gonna be listening for incoming connections. Uh, inside of here, I need to pass this as a tuple, so I'll need another uh, set of parentheses. The first thing that I'll do is I'll give the IP address, and we're gonna get that IP address just like we talked about before, socket.gethost by name, and then by what name? Well, we're gonna call socket.gethostName to, uh, to get the name of the computer and then we'll get the IP address of that name and so now I'm just going to come outside of the the parentheses right here and I'll put a comma because now I need to specify my selected port address and we said for this we're just going to arbitrarily choose one two three four five awesome so our server is, side socket is now created and it's bound to a specific location. The last thing that we have to do is we have to tell it that it should listen for incoming connections, right? So like we created the socket, we sent the socket to a specific location. The last thing that we have to do is say, hey, you should be listening for incoming connections. So we'll just put a little comment here. We'll say put the socket into listening mode to listen for any possible connections. And so to do that, we just simply call our server socket, the socket we named, and we'll call the dot listen method uh, on that server socket. Uh, perfect. So if I run this right now, hopefully we won't get any errors. Uh, nope. So no errors here. So that tells me that this socket uh, is essentially listening, but you can see the program just stopped. So we're going to need to add more to this uh, to make sure that our uh, server socket is continuously listening. Um, but I think this is a good place to stop for right now. Um, I'm going to keep this open, this file open, because we're going to add more to it. But in our next video, we're going to begin working on our client side uh, uh, script. So I will see you then. Hello and welcome back. Now that our server is up and running, let's create a new file that will hold our client script. So I'm going to come over here, file, new file. We'll name it a Python file. And I'll hit Control S to save. I'm in that same location, the directory socket intro that I was before. And I will call this TCP client. All right. And I'll put just put a little comment here. It will just say TCP client side. Um, the first thing that I have to do uh, is import the socket module. So import socket just like I did before. And so now what we'll do is we're going to create another socket similar to what we did on our server side. So we're going to call this socket, we'll call it client socket. 
and we will then use the socket module to create the socket so socket dot socket and we have to pass in the correct information here again um, I'll put a little comment here I like to comment things so I'm going to just say create a client side IPv4 socket uh, and that's going to be using AF underscore INET and TCP which is soc underscore stream so let's pass in that information. So our client side socket is going to be using IPv4. So socket dot AF underscore INET comma and TCP. So socket dot sock stream. All right, perfect. So with our server, if we come back over here and look at our server socket, we had to essentially bind it or attach it to a given location and then tell it to listen at that given location. Um, with our client, we don't really have to bind it or attach it to anything uh, to a specific location, and we definitely don't want it to just sit there and listen for incoming connections. Instead, what we want to do is we want to have our client socket uh, go connect to some other already established socket, like a server socket, at a specified location. So here, what we'll use is the connect method. And so for our purposes, we have to tell the socket where it's going to connect. So we're going to need an IP address and a port address. And I'm running both the client and the server scripts on the same machine here. So I'm just going to use my local IP address again, which we know we can guide, uh, dynamically get using the socket module. So we'll say here, we'll say connect the socket to a server uh, located at a given IP and port. All right, so we'll take our client socket and I'm gonna call the dot connect method. And inside of here, I'm gonna pass that information as a tuple. And so the first piece of information we're gonna pass is our IP address. So we're gonna do socket dot get host by name and then we'll do socket dot get host name. All right, and that's going to get us our IP address, very similar to what we did uh, over here on our server side. And then we'll just pass in our port. And so we're going to keep the same port number as well. So we'll do port 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Awesome. Uh, so that's uh, great. So this IP and port are where the server is waiting, listening, and it's the same IP and port that we're going to tell the client to go connect to. So this seems like it should work. But now, once the connection is made between the sockets, what exactly do we want to do? Well, we want to send some data, right? That's exactly what we want to do. We essentially want to be able to send uh, data back and forth between these two, uh, these two sockets. So right now, our server is set to listen for an incoming connection. So I'm going to go back to my server side script. Um, so what is it supposed to do once it receives an incoming connection? Well, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to try to get the information about that incoming connection. And so we're going to start, if you notice, if I run my server script, it it runs and then it stops. So we don't want that to happen. We want it to listen continuously or infinitely while connections are trying to be made. And so we're going to do that. Um, I'll do that with an infinite while loop. So I'll say here, I'll put a little comment. We'll just say um, listen forever uh, to accept. And right now we'll accept any uh, incoming connection any connection. So we'll say while wow, true. And now uh, let's take a look at what's going to happen um, here. So when a connection is made through our client socket, we want the server to accept or allow that connection. And so we can do that with the accept method. Now this method returns uh, two pieces of information. It returns a socket object or the socket that was used to make the connection, our client uh, socket, and it returns the address of the incoming connection. So let's grab those two pieces of information and then we'll use some print statements to maybe print that out so we can see what's actually uh, happening here. So we'll just say inside of here, we'll say accept every single connection and store two pieces of information. All right, so it's, we're going to get the client socket. So we're going to get a socket object, hopefully, and then we'll get the client address from here. And so we want to accept our incoming connection. So I'll, I'll call my socket server socket and we'll call the dot accept method. So when our client socket tries to connect to our server socket, 
we will accept it and we're going to get two pieces of information. We're going to get information about the socket that was just connected and then about that address. So let's use some print statements here to uh, print some information. So I'll say print and we'll call the type function. I want to see what the what type of object the client socket uh, variable is that we just grabbed here from the accept method. And then we'll actually print that information. So we'll say print client socket. And then we'll do the similar thing to the client address. So we'll call the type function and pass in client address. And this might just help us in the future as we're trying to write more complicated programs. It's good to know what we are getting from these uh, from this accept method. And so then we'll print client uh, address. OK, awesome. Um, let's also maybe print a message to our server. So on the, the server side's terminal, letting us know that someone has connected uh, to our, our socket. So we'll say print. And I'll use an F string here. Uh, and we'll just say connected to. And then we'll pass in the uh, the client address that we connected with. So we'll pass in client address. And then I'll just put a, 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 maybe an exclamation point. And then a new line character so it, it breaks it up. So now if we think about this, what we're going to do, let's, well, let's run this. Let's see how this works. So here is my server. It's running. OK, so now we are in our infinite while loop. You can see that the program hasn't ended. And so now if I run my client script, hopefully we will actually connect here. And so we'll, we'll start another instance. No errors on this side. Program is still running. And if we go back, we can see, oh, perfect. So if we look here, we can see that we printed out um, the type uh, of the client socket. So it is a socket object. And there is that socket object right there. So this is the client socket that we connected to. You can see that af.inet, sockstream, all that stuff. Here is the uh, IP address uh, that we are connecting to uh, and the uh, port address. Awesome. And then uh, we are printing out the address that we got, which is a tuple, which is what we expect. Uh, and that's 192.168.1.7, our local address. And then if you notice, that port number, 502 277 is not the port number that we had specified in our our client script right we specified 12345 well 12345 is the port address we want to connect to and this is the port address that the client is using for that connection all right so the the client isn't going to connect at that port it's going to this 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 socket is running at this arbitrary port number of uh, 50277 but we look we get our nice connected uh, uh, connected to and we get our information uh, so everything here is working out really nicely so far perfect so I'm going to just uh, I'll, I'll stop the process here all right and close these out and the last thing that we'll do here in this video so now that we have made the connection let's have the server uh, once it gets a connection actually send some information over to the client so we have the information about the client socket that we just connected to right so it's it's stored right here client socket so we'll take that socket that we just grabbed and we'll call the dot send method uh, on it and so let's send a string we'll say you are connected so let's put a new comment here we'll say send a message to the client that just connected connected and so we'll call the client socket which is the socket that we grabbed when we uh, accepted the connection and we'll call dot send so we want to send information back to that client socket and so I don't know I'll pass in the string you are connected and so perfect so let's try running this now and let's see what happens so if I click run all right, I'll click run over here on my client to get the connection. And if we look, we get an error. Uh, and so our error here is uh, on the line where we're trying to send our information. It says uh, a bytes like object is required, not a string. And so this is really important here. So we can't just send uh, strings through our socket, uh, our line of communication. What we have to do is we have to encode it and send it as a bytes object. So strings and other pieces of data have to be encoded with a specific encoding method in order to enter the data stream between our two uh, socket channels here which you know it really isn't a problem because there's a method a string method we can use to do that we can call dot encode on our string so if we come over here I'll 
type in. Uh, so here's our string you are connected and then I'll type dot in code and typically what we'll do is we'll pass in an encoder. Um, I think the encoder we'll use is UTF-8, uh, so utf tac 8 I think that is the default encoder, um, so you could leave that out, but I like to specify it because maybe we'll change that uh, in the future. Um, so now if we run this, hopefully we won't get that error. We'll be able to send that information uh, just fine. So we'll run, we'll run, and if I come back here, uh, we can see that there was no error. So that data is being sent um, without without any issues. Of course, now that data is being sent over to the client, but we got to do something with that client uh, script in order to actually display the information. Uh, however, I think this is a great place to stop here in this video. Uh, in our next video, what we'll do is we'll wrap up sending data between these two um, sockets uh, and, and finish it up here with the TCP uh, communication. So I will see you in that next video. Hello and welcome back. Now that we are sending data uh, on our server side, right, we're sending this encoded message, you are connected, uh, and we're going to encode it as a bytes object. Let's go uh, and receive it on the client side. So I'm going to come over to my uh, client script uh, and we'll say, I'll put a new comment here. After the connection is made, we'll say receive uh, a message from the server and we'll also just claim here when we do that uh, so we can use the receive method uh, and when we use the receive RECV method um, what we have to do is pass in the maximum number of bytes that the socket should expect to receive in one single message so I'll, I'll add that here I'll say you must specify the max number of bytes to receive. So we're going to create a variable. I'll call this variable message and we'll take our socket, uh, client socket, and we'll call the dot receive here method. And inside of here, we have to pass in the maximum number of bytes that we're going to receive. And so right now, I am just going to pick a very, you know, a large number here for just simple text communication. I'll do 1024. All right. And that's not going to be an issue at all here. But you may be asking yourself, well, what happens if we try to send something larger than 1024? Um, and I'm just going to say for now, it won't be a problem. But later on, when say we are creating like a multiplayer game and we're sending lots of information, it will become a problem. So at that point, we will address the issue um, by using fixed length headers that specify the size of whatever incoming packet uh, is coming in. But for right now, we're just going to, we'll arbitrarily set this size to be 1024. And maybe we'll play with it a little while uh, in a couple of videos and we'll see the shortcomings of doing this. Um, so let's test everything out and let's see if this works. Well, we should probably print the message, right? So we'll say print um, message. Otherwise, we won't know it, uh, we, we got it. So I'll run the server. All right, perfect. I'll run the client. And hopefully we will send that information and then we'll print it. And you can see it did sort of print it. Uh, and it says you are connected and it's got this weird uh, like B in front of it. Um, and that's because if we actually print, let's print the type, uh, we'll call the type function on message. What we'll see is it's not actually a string. Um, I don't think it's a string. Um, Oh, I got to stop. Yeah, that's right. So I just got a, an error. It says only one usage of each socket address is normally permitted. I was trying to run the server again without stopping the previous um, uh, one that I had run. So you can only run this once, right? So now that's running. And if I run it again, let's take a look. So here's our message, you are connected, but what? it's not a string object, it's actually a bytes object. So recall that if we go over to our server here, we had to encode the string uh, and turn it into a bytes object to send it over our data stream. And so now once we got it on the client side, what we should we should typically do is we should decode it on the client end. And so we can do that by using the decode method for string. So message, uh, here is the message, and I will just say, um, message dot decode and then I'm going to pass in the same encoder that we used on the client side so I'll pass in UTF uh, 8 again I think this is the default one but um, I still like to, um, to, to to print it in there uh, so I'll delete this and if we run this now hopefully we should see that we're getting a, a string object oh and I made the same mistake I did before let me stop the previous instance and run my server all right, so there's that. We'll run this here. Uh, and so you can see we now have a string object. You are connected. 
Uh, awesome. So this is working out great. I think it's good practice uh, to maybe uh, just talk about closing our socket connections once our communication is done. So the last thing that I'll do here is I will uh, close the client socket. And so this is on my client uh, script. And I'll just say client socket dot close. And maybe I'll go back over and do something similar here. I don't think I need to print the the type, oh, I, I got rid of that there, so that's good. So I'll save this, and I'll come back over here, and let's close the um, the server socket as well. So I'll maybe just come down here and say close the connection, and so we'll say server socket dot close. All right, and if I run this, what's uh, interestingly, I think we're going to get an error, and let's let's just quickly discuss why we're getting an error. Oh, I keep doing that. I got to stop this. There we go. I'll run this. All right, I'll run this. Sends the information, you are connected, that is closed, great. And if we come over here, let's look at the output, um, we do get an error. And the reason why we get this error is we are closing the socket, but we are still stuck inside of this infinite while loop. And so the socket, which we just closed, is now trying to accept a new incoming connection. Uh, so we can't do that. That's like an issue, right? So one of the things that we can do is once we close the socket here, we'll just use a, a break statement to break out of the infinite while loop. Um, the last thing that I'm going to do is just clean this up a little bit. Uh, I'll put some comments here. So we're not printing out our host name and IP address, and I don't really need to print these things out anymore. Um, however, I will leave them in there just for like debugging purposes, okay? So if we run this, everything should be good. There's our server. All right, nothing's happening. We'll run this. There's our client. It says you are connected, and if we look at our server, it says we have been connected uh, to 192.168.1.7 at port uh, 5427. What a weird way to read a number. 50427, uh, 50,427. Awesome. So everything is working really great here. Um, we got a nice basic TCP server and TCP client using our sockets module. I think this is a great place to stop, and I will see you in the next video. Hello, and welcome back. In our last video, we set up a very simple client-server relationship using a TCP socket. Important things to note here. On the server side, we created a socket and then listened for incoming connections. We uh, created the socket, we bind, bound it to a specific location, and then we listened for our connections. And then on the client side, we actually had to go and connect to that uh, established socket. Um, and then once our connection was established, we simply called the send and receive methods to send data back and forth. Now, we're going to be using TCP sockets for all of our projects uh, in these videos. But for completion, I wanted to quickly show a UDP client uh, server socket relationship. So recall, UDP is a connectionless protocol. So no connection will be made. Data is just simply going to be sent and received. So I'm going to start by creating two new files. So I'll do file, new file, we'll make it a Python file, and I'll make a second one, file, new file, I'll make it a Python file. Oh, I guess I should save it first. So I'll save this first one in our sockets intro. I'll call this UDP server. All right, and then file, new file, and we'll call this one, we'll save it as UDP client. All right, perfect. So now that I've got those two files here, um, let's start on our server side. Um, so I'll just put a comment here. I'll say UDP server side. And we'll import the socket module, just like uh, we have done in the past. OK, so now on the server side, I'm going to create a server socket. And it's going to use IPv4 uh, and then UDP instead of a TCP protocol. So I'll put a comment. We'll say create a server side socket that uses AFI net. Um, I had socket, uh, well, IPv4. Yep. All right. And we'll then say and UDP. So instead of sock stream here, um, which is how we reference TCP protocol, we'll use uh, sock underscore dgram, all right, for UDP, uh, datagram. So let's, let's create this socket. So we'll say server socket is equal to, I'll call my socket module, 
dot socket. And now inside of here, we have to pass in those two pieces of information. So it's going to follow IPv4 protocol socket dot AF underscore INET. And it is going to be UDP. So socket uh, dot sock D gram. All right, perfect. Um, so now that we have our server socket, what I'm going to do is I will bind it or attach it to a given location, just like we did with our TCP uh, socket. So we'll say bind our new socket to a tuple that is going to be IP address and port address. All right, so we'll call our socket server socket and we'll call the bind method and inside of here we're going to pass a tuple. Uh, we'll pass in our local IP address and we, we know how we get that. I'm going to do socket.get host by name and that's going to give us our IP address of a specific host name and we're going to get the host name by calling socket.get host name and I'll choose an arbitrary port number again I'll use one, two, three, four, five. Awesome. Uh, so now we've created our UDP uh, server socket and we have uh, it bound to a specific location. Now in our TCP server, if you look, the next thing that we did is we put it into listening mode to listen for our possible incoming connections. Uh, however, we do not have to listen for any incoming connections here because UDP is a connectionless protocol. Instead, I'm just going to sit around and I guess wait to receive some information from a client that has sent information to this specific IP and port address. So I'm going to actually put a comment here. I'll say we are not listening or accepting connections since UDP is a connectionless protocol. That's just there for, you know, my, um, I think my understanding uh, and hopefully your understanding. So we're just going to wait to receive some information. So rather than use the receive method like we did to get information here on the TCP client, right? Client, um, we we use the dot send, and then our client used the uh, where was it? Dot dot receive. Um, we have to use the uh, receive from method when working with UDP. So I'm going to come back over to my UDP server and we'll use the receive from method. And this is going to return uh, the data that was sent, like maybe a message, as well as the address information that it came from. So I'm going to grab both of these pieces of information and grabbing the address here is going to then allow me to maybe send some information back. Because remember, no connection was made so I need to know where this information is going to be going. So I'll, I'll create two variables here. I'll create message and address, and we'll send it, set it equal to our server socket dot. Uh, instead of receive, we're going to say receive from. And again, inside of here, I have to specify the maximum um, size uh, byte uh, of the object that I'm going to receive, and we'll just arbitrarily say uh, 10, uh, 24 uh, right here. All right, perfect. Um, and so now let's go through and actually uh, print this information. So we'll print the message. Of course, we know that this message, when we get it, is going to be a bytes object, so I want to decode it. So I'll say dot decode, and I'll pass in UTF-8 uh, as my encoder here. And then let's also print, for the, the purpose of this, let's also print the address. Okay, awesome. Uh, I think this looks good. Um, on, now let's head over to the client side. So I'm going to save this control S to save and let's head over to our client side and see what we're going to do here. So we'll put a comment here. We'll say UDP client side and we'll import socket. And on the client side, we're going to make a UDP socket. So we'll say create a UDP uh, IPv4 socket and so we'll say client socket is equal to socket dot socket and inside of here I want to pass in the right information so I'm going to use socket dot AF underscore INET there's IPv4 and then we'll do socket dot uh, sock underscore dgram and so now there is my UDP uh, socket all created Perfect. So now that we have this, let's simply send some information uh, to our server, right? We've got this client. Let's send some information to our server. Now, if we look over here, when we use TCP, we use the send method. That was all we needed, right? Because we already had a connection made. We were just sending information through this connection. But UDP is connectionless. So we don't 
necessarily have a, a connection, or a place to send this information. So what we have to do is we have to specify where we are going to send our, our information here. So let's say, um, we'll, you will say send some information via a connectionless protocol protocol. So we're going to, instead of using the send method, uh, we'll use the send to method, just like we used receive from instead of uh, receive, we have to use send to instead of send. So I'll say client socket dot send to, and then what do I want to send? I'm going to send the string hello, I don't know, hello server, server world, and we know that we have to encode this string, so dot encode, encode, and we'll pass in our encoder utf8, and now I need to uh, specify where exactly I'm supposed to send this. So I'm going to send it to uh, a specific location, uh, an IP address. And so we're going to use our local address. So socket.gethostbyName, uh, socket.gethostname, and then a specified port address. And we're using 12345. So I'm not actually making the connection. I'm just sending that information uh, there uh, to that, that, that desired location. Okay, so I think this looks pretty good so far. Um, and so if we run this right now, let me save this. I will run my server. So we're expecting to receive a message. So here's my UDP server, no problem. And if I run this, here's my client. We should hopefully make a connection. And if I come back over to my server, it says, hello, server world. So the message was received. And then we are printing information about that connection. So uh, it looks like our UDP you know, server client socket is working nicely here connectionless, right? It is connectionless. Um, perfect. So I think this is a good place to stop here in this video. Uh, in our next video, maybe we're going to mess around with our um, our buffer size. So we've specified that, you know, the maximum size we should expect to receive is 1024. And let's talk about what that means if we change it for both the UDP and the TCP uh, server and client relationships. So I'll see you in that next video. Hello and welcome back. Um, now that we have uh, you know completed uh, really basic TCP connections and UDP connections, let's play around a little bit with the buffer size. Um, this this maximum uh, size uh, we kind of arbitrarily sent to uh, 10, uh, 1,024 bytes uh, for our, our message packets. And let's mess around with it for both the UDP and the TCP uh, sockets and see how they handle them. So we'll start with uh, our TCP socket. So with TCP, if I try to send something that is larger than the buffer size, the message is going to go through. It is guaranteed to get there. However, you might not get the whole message at once, but it's ensured that the, the message will get to its location. So to show this, let's open up our, um, our client uh, side uh, TCP. And right here where we are receiving our message, I'm going to copy this code where we, we're getting the message and then I'm printing it, copy it, and I will paste it in here. Uh, so we have, we're going to receive it twice here. And then let's also change the buffer size from 1024. Let's just change it down to 10 bytes. Okay, perfect. So let's look at our server. So I'm going to save this. Let's go over to our server. And if we look at the server side here, we are still sending one message to our client. It says, you are connected. So let's now run this. On the client side, we're going to receive it, uh, but we're saying our maximum size can only be 10. So let's see what happens here. So if I run this, all right, and now I run my client, Interesting, right? So you can see we're getting our entire message. Um, we received the first 10 bytes, U, R, Co. And if we look, that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And then in our second message, we're getting the rest of it. 
you know, necked it. Okay. Um, so we did in fact get it. Um, in our, you know, first receive call uh, right here, we get the first 10 bytes. And then in the second receive call, we get the rest of our message, even though our server only sent one message. It sort of is stored uh, in guarantees that the information is going to get there. We just have to pull it from the data stream. So that's how it's going to work with uh, our TCP. And so I'm going to actually just quickly go back and, and, and change this. So I'm going to get rid of the uh, the second message here, and I'm going to change this back to 1024 uh, and, and save that so we don't mess up any of those uh, changes. So now let's look at the UDP side. Um, so I'm going to come over here to where are we receiving? So we're receiving our message uh, right here. So let's receive this. and I'm going to change this to, to 10. Okay, perfect. And so, you know, we know that this isn't going to be enough, right? Hello server world is going to be more than 10 bytes. So maybe I want to run this a couple of times. So I'm going to, you know, copy this. I'll copy the whole thing and we'll paste it uh, down here. So let's run our server and see what happens. All right, so our server is running. Let's run our client. We're sending the information. And if you notice here, nothing happens. Um, the packet is simply dropped. We get an error. It says a message sent on the datagram socket was larger than the internal message buffer or some other network limit. Or the buffer used to receive the datagram was smaller than the datagram itself. So interesting, right? Uh, it, it doesn't work. So to quickly recap, TCP uh, is a connection-based protocol that essentially guarantees that our packets are going to be delivered. You know, they might not be delivered all at once, depending on what the buffer size is, but the information will be in the data stream and we can pull it down um, you know, at a later time. UDP, on the other hand, is a connectionless protocol that does not guarantee that packets are delivered. And so you know, here, in this case, there was an error, and so the packets just dropped. You're not going to you're not going to get any of that information. Now that has its pros, it has its cons. You know, because of this, UDP uh, typically is a faster uh, you know is faster, and that's if you're you know working with data that's constantly being updated and being sent. Uh, maybe you don't really care that we dropped a packet because you know an updated one is going to be coming you know right after it. You know, maybe things like a video call, right? UDP is something that's going to be desired. However, for what we're going to be doing moving forward, we're going to be using our TCP connections. Um, so I'm going to just change my UDP um, uh, buffer size here back to 1024. And one of the things that we'll do in the future is we'll talk about how we might handle um, changing this buffer size so that it's dynamic so that we can determine how big the packets are that are going to be coming in and set our buffer size accordingly. But that's something that we're going to be doing that's a little bit more advanced and we'll be doing it um, later on uh, in these videos. So for right now, I think this is a great place to stop. We have a nice overview of TCP sockets, UDP sockets, and we're going to start diving further into those TCP connections uh, starting in our next video. So I will see you then. Hello and welcome back. In our last few videos, we saw how to send data over the network using our socket module. Now that we understand how TCP and UDP sockets work, let's expand on our TCP server client socket. In the next few videos, we will build on this idea such that our data can be sent from server to client and client to server repeatedly. Essentially, we're going to build a basic two-way chat that will take place via a terminal. So to begin, we're going to create two new Python files. Uh, and so I'll just come here and do file, new file. I'll set it as a Python file. I'll put a comment here. I'll say chat server side. All right, it's going to be our server side chat. And I'm going to save this still in my socket intro folder. And I'll just call it chat uh, server. All right. And then I'll create a new file, file, new file. Set it as a Python file. And I'll say client chat side. Uh, I mean, <laughs> chat client side, chat client side. Perfect. All right, and I'll save this, and I'll save this as chat client. All right, wonderful. So I'm going to start with my uh, server here. So the first thing that we're going to do is we will import the socket module. So import socket. 
And now what we'll do is before, you know, we were kind of like typing in our um, IP address, our ports, our encoders, maybe the maximum byte size. We were just mixing it all within our program. And I think it'll be better for us if we pull that information out and define them as some constant variables that we're going to use throughout the scope of our program here. So I'll say define constants to be used. So we'll start with our host IP address. So I'll say host IP. And so we're going to just get the IP address of our local machine. So socket.get host by name. And then we'll pass into here socket.get host uh, name. All right, so now we have our host IP, and if we decide we want to change this later on, we can just come over here and override that command. Uh, let's do something similar for our uh, host port address. So we'll say uh, host port, oops, there we go, host port, and I'm going to pick that arbitrary value, one, two, three, four, five. You, you can use whatever value you want, right? Just make sure you're not using a port that a service is currently running on. Uh, next, I'm going to define an encoder, encoder, and we'll define this as UTF-8. And we'll use this to encode and decode any of our information. And then lastly, um, I'll pick a byte size for our, um, you know, our, our packages, our streams of information that are coming in um, that's large enough so that we really don't have to worry about chopping off any of the message or anything like that. So I'll just say byte size, uh, uh, <laughs> I can spell, byte size is going to equal to 1024. Okay, perfect. So we've got those things defined. So now let's create our server socket using the socket module. And so again, we're going to set the socket to use the IPv4 uh, and TCP protocols. So we'll say here, create a server socket. And so we'll say server, we'll, we'll call the server socket, server socket, and we'll call the socket module and we'll call socket, the socket method. And inside of here, we'll pass uh, socket dot af underscore inet. There's IPv4 and then we'll do socket dot uh, sock un underscore, oops, all capitals, stream. And there's TCP. All right, perfect. And let's also, we'll say create a server socket, bind it to a IP port, and then we'll say, and listen. We're gonna do all three of these things uh, right here. So we'll create the socket. Since we're, uh, now that the socket is created, we'll bind it to a location. So we'll say server socket, we'll call the dot bind method. And in here, we're gonna pass a tuple. Uh, and that tuple will be the host IP and host port uh, constant variables that we had defined earlier. And lastly, since we are using a TCP uh, protocol here, TCP connection, we are going to listen for any incoming connections. Um, so let's do that. So we'll say here, uh, server socket dot listen. Okay, perfect. Uh, so now what we can do is we can quickly print a message to the terminal informing the user that the server is essentially running. So we'll just, this will kind of just be some visual feedback. And then once we're here, um, we'll also listen for any incoming connections. And if we get an incoming connection, we'll um, send a, a message letting the incoming client know that they have su successfully been connected. Uh, so let's, let's do that. So we'll say print, um, we'll just say accept any incoming uh, connection and let them know they are connected. So we'll give some sort of response back. So the first thing we'll do is we'll just print that the uh, server is running. So that'll be visually for us on the server end. Oh, let me put that new line character inside of my string, backslash n. All right, now that we have that, let's accept any incoming connection. So remember, when we accept an incoming connection, we're going to get two pieces of information. We're going to get the um, the socket that is connecting to us, and we're going to get the uh, address of that socket. So we'll we'll call this our client socket, and we'll call it client address. We'll get those two pieces of information by calling our server socket, and we'll call the dot accept method on the server socket. So it'll accept anything that connects to it and then store the information in these two variables, client socket and client address. Awesome. So now that the connection has occurred, we're going to send some information to the client socket to verify that they have successfully connected. So let's send some information to the client socket, which we have right here. So I'll call client socket and we'll call dot send. Uh, recall, we don't need the send to like we did with UDP because we have a connection form. So we can just send right to our through our connection channel and we'll say you are connected to the server dot dot dot. 
Sure, and then I'll do backslash n for a new line. Uh, now, don't forget here, this is a string, and if we want to send information, we have to encode it and turn it into a bytes object, so I'll call dot encode, and inside of here, I'll pass my encoder constant variable, which is um, right up here. So, so far, I think this is pretty good on our server side for our chat. I'm going to save this, and I'm going to come over to our uh, client uh file. So right at the top here I'm going to import socket um, just like before we got to make sure we bring in the socket uh, module and now let's also set some constant variables so we'll say define constants to be used. This is just going to help us. I think it's a nice thing for us to do moving forward. So I'll have a destination IP address. And so for me, my destination IP is actually going to be the same as my host IP, right? We're on the same computer. So I'm just going to do socket.gethost by name and socket.get host name. Okay, uh, and I think later on, you know, in, in a future video further along, I'll show you how to configure your router so that you can have connections coming in from different places and that, and that sort of thing. But we're, we're not there yet, so we're just going to do everything local on the same computer. Uh, let's set up a uh, destination port, so dest port, and we'll choose 12345. We'll do an encoder again, and our encoder is going to be UTF-8. We'll make sure that those are the same, and then we'll specify a maximum byte size of 1024. And again, we're not really worried too much about sending a, a message that's bigger than that uh, at this point. All right, perfect. Um, so now, once we have these things defined, let's create our client socket again, uh, and we will um, connect to our server. So we're gonna, we're gonna re kind of reproduce this section of code, but remember on the client side, we don't have to bind and listen, we're just gonna make a connection. So we'll say, create a client socket and connect to the server. So in here, I'll call this client socket, and we're going to do socket dot socket. All right, so call the socket module and the socket method in here. We want to have it be IPv4, so socket dot AF underscore INET. And we want to follow TCP protocol, so we'll do uh, socket dot sock underscore stream. All right, so that creates the socket, and so now we have to connect to our server. So we'll call our client socket, which we just created, and we'll call the dot connect method. And in here, we have to pass a tuple uh, of where it needs to connect to. Well, it's going to connect to the destination IP that we specified and the destination port that we specified. So we can clear, you know, we can change these whenever we want to, and we'll we'll alter where that connection is going. All right, awesome. Um, so if we look here, uh, I think this is a, maybe a good place to stop. Um, if we run this, if I run, oh, let me run my server first. All right, so server is running. That looks great. And if I run this, we just stop, right? We just stop. So the server, the server has sent a message. I think the server has sent... Um, you are connected to the server, we, we're sending it, but we haven't yet received it here on our client side. Um, but we'll work on that, I think, in the next video. This is a great place to stop. So what we now want to do is have the ability for both the client and server to send and receive information, essentially until one party decides to quit. And you know, when we write that, that's where we'll get receiving that message here on the client side. So this is a great place to stop, and I will see you in our next video. Hello and welcome back. Our server and client scripts here for our basic kind of one-way chat uh, are well on their way. So now let's actually work on adding that chat functionality. Uh, let's start with the client side since we are already sending a confirmation message on the server side uh, to that client. So what we need to do is we need to um, essentially receive this message, decode it, and then display it. In fact, um, we're going to receive and decode uh, and display all of the incoming messages, right? We want lots of these messages to happen. So what we can do is we can put this inside of a loop. So um, we'll use a while loop. And so we'll say while true. And I don't know, I'll just put a comment here. I'll say send and receive receive messages. All right, so while true, uh, inside of here, the first thing that we'll do is receive the sent message and we will decode it. So we'll say receive uh, information from the server. 
So we'll just call this message. All right, we're receiving a message. And so we're going to get that by calling the receive method on our socket that we have here, client socket. So client socket.recv. And inside of here, we have to specify the maximum size of the, the, you know, the packet that's going to come through. And so we've declared that as byte size. And then we know that we also want to decode this message. So this is going to be a bytes object. And so I'm going to actually call dot decode right here and pass in our specified encoder. And so I can receive and decode kind of all in one step here. And I think that's going to be really nice. Um, so so the next thing that we're going to do is we want to have the the ability for a user to essentially end the program, right? And so we're going to check to see if the message that was sent was the string quit. And if it was, we are simply just going to end the chat. And we'll sort of use this string as a kind of like a flag to indicate that the chat is done. However, when one party receives a quit flag, they should also send a quit flag back to the other party to sort of validate that they are quitting and to start the quit process on the end of the communication channel. So let's see. So let's see how we might do this. Um, we'll say quit if the connected uh, server wants to quit else keep sending messages. So we'll come down here, we're going to check the value of message. So if message is equal to the string quit, then what are we going to do? Well, we said that we should probably send a quit flag back to the server to verify that we're going to start the quitting process. So we'll say client socket dot send. So we're going to send and what are we going to send? Well, we're going to send the quit flag uh, right back. And we're going to encode this using our encoder so that we can send it through our uh, socket here. And then let's just print a, a message here for our own purposes. I'll do on a new line. So backslash n. I'll say ending the chat dot dot dot. Goodbye. Awesome. And then I will call a break statement to break out of the while loop. Um, perfect. Now, if the message isn't quit, then what should we do? Well, we'll have an else block here for our if statement. Well, we should display the message, right? So let's do that. We'll say print, uh, and I'll use an F string here to have a new line. And then I'm going to print the value of the message that we received. All right, perfect. So that looks like it's going to work out quite nicely here. And so now what do we want to do? Well, inside of this while loop, once we get the message, we then want to get the client to put in some information that we can send back to the server. So let's do that. So we'll come over here and we'll create a or override our variable message and we'll call the input function and we'll put a prompt here where it'll just say message. And so whatever the user types in will then be put into our variable message and then let's send that value back to the server. So to send it, we'll call client, uh, so oh, silent, client socket dot send and then we'll send message but we know we have to encode this so we'll call the encode method and we'll pass in our given encoder. All right, I think that's pretty good. The last thing that I'm going to do here on the uh, the client side is if we break out of this infinite while loop, I am going to just simply uh, we'll, we'll, we'll close the client socket. So if we've quit, then we'll break out of here and I will say close the client socket and we'll just call client socket dot close. All right, and I'm going to save this because I think our client socket, uh, our, our, our chat client, is pretty much done. So let's head over to the server side and let's take a look at what we have to do here. So we want another infinite while loop. So we'll put a comment here. We'll say uh, send slash receive messages. Okay, and we'll start with a while loop. So while true, we're going to do something really similar here. So um, we're going to check to receive a message from the client socket, making sure that we state, you know, the maximum byte size in our encoding method. So we got to get uh, some information. So we'll say receive information from the client. So we'll call this message and we'll call the client socket, which we have uh, gotten here when we accepted that connection, we have that client socket, perfect. So client socket dot recv, receive, and we'll specify our byte size that we have defined, byte size, uh, and then we'll decode it, decode dot decode, and pass in the encoder that we have defined. Now that we have that message, we're gonna do something, you know, almost identical to what we had before. So we're gonna say quit 
if the client socket wants to quit, else display the message, we'll just say. So if the value of message is equal to that string quit, what are we going to do? Well, we will acknowledge the fact that we received a quit flag and we'll send one back. So I'll say client socket dot send quit dot encode using our encoder. So we'll encode that string as a bytes object. And then we'll print our message here. Um, oops. On a new line, we'll say ending the chat dot 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 goodbye. All right. And then I will break out of my while loop. Now, otherwise else, so if the message is quit, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll end the chat else. What are we going to do? We're going to print the message. So we'll follow the same form formatting. I'll use an F string here. Uh, I'll put a new line and then we'll print the value of whatever that message was. And then we'll override that variable message by getting some input from the, uh, the server here. Input, uh, and we'll just say message. And then once we have that new uh, message to send, we are going to send it to our client socket. So client socket dot send, and we'll send message. But of course, we have to encode that string using our encoder. All right, uh, the last thing that we'll do, just like before, once we break out of the while loop, we'll simply close the socket by calling server socket dot close. So we'll close our server socket that we had originally created uh, over here. All right, so I think this is all set. Uh, let's test this and see how this works. Hopefully we should be able to kind of have like a, a two-way chat going on here. So server is running. Um, we can say client is running. And so if we look here, our client says you're connected to the server. And I'll say, hi, server, this is client. And I'll hit enter. And if we come back over here, we got hi server, this is client. We can say, how are you client? And send it. And it looks like that message is coming through. How are you client? I am good, you. We'll send it. And then let's see what happens if we type quit. Um, uh, quit, we'll just say quit. All right, and it says ending the chat, goodbye. And then over here, we've got ending the chat, goodbye. So it looks like this is um, working perfect. So you might not like having to go you know, back and forth and back and forth here. So one of the things that we can do is if I just minimize this and I go to the directory where I've got these um, files, all right, here they are, here they are. So I'm gonna just come in here, I'm gonna right click and I'm gonna open uh, in terminal. All right, so here we are. I can type in uh, Python and we'll type, what did I call this? Chat server. Uh, yep, so I'll type on Python chat server.py and there it is, server is running. And so now I'll do something similar. I'll open in terminal. And here I can type in Python chat client.py. And so now I can run them in separate windows and we can kind of see that the same thing is happening. So we can say, hey, what's going on? All right. And then there it is. Nothing. What's going on? <laughs> going on with you. Uh, and so we're getting that back and forth. So just another way that we can run this and we'll, we'll pass the quit flag again, ending the chat, goodbye, ending the chat, uh, goodbye. Awesome. So this has worked out really nicely. And we now have, you know, a nice little program here. Maybe we can put um, one of these, you know, the, the, the server script on one computer on your home network, the client script on another computer on your home network. And you just have to adjust. Uh, let's just see, you just would have to adjust um, on the chat client right here, your destination IP. So, right, if your server, we're on, I think I'm running on uh, 192.168.1.7 is my IP address. So your server is going to get their own IP, but then your chat uh, client, you just have to change it. So maybe if you were running this on like uh, 192.168.1.7, 15, you would just type that, you could just type that um, IP address in right here. All right, I think this is a great place to stop. Um, this kind of gives us a really nice overview of some of the functionality of, um, you know, the socket module. Um, I think one of the next things that we'll probably do is try to build on this idea of the chat, you know, a chat room. Right now, we can only have one client essentially connect to our server. If we try to have more than one client connect to our server, I think we're going to have some issues. So, for instance, if you know, I'll run my chat server and my server is running and then I come over here and I run my my client. OK, so this is great. Uh, we'll just say this is great. All right. And so that went through. Yes, it is. But let's see what happens if I try to run another um, 
client. So I'll come over here, I'll open in terminal, and I'll run Python chat client. You can see that it just hangs here because once we have our connection, um, we're not allowing other connections to, to happen. Right? If we come back over and look at our, our code here for the chat server, our connection, where are we accepting our connection? We're accepting the connection here outside of this while loop. And so the next thing that we'll look at is how do we handle having multiple connections on our server so that maybe we could have not just one person connect but two, three, four, five people all connect and we can facilitate a chat between multiple people. Um, so that's where we're headed. We're going to need to use uh, another um, module or another library to help us accomplish that uh, but I can't wait to begin looking at that with you in our next video. I'll see you then. Hello and welcome back. In our last video, we finished and tested our basic, you know, two-way chat application between a single ser a server and a single client. And this works pretty good as we could send data back and forth from a server to a single client. However, there were some pretty glaring shortcomings. And so I want to talk about a few of them just initially here at this video. And we're going to use those for motivation uh, for our next project. Um, so I'm going to minimize these. I'll open these up in my uh, terminal here so we can see the chats better. So I'll run... Um, Python, Python uh, chat server.py. All right, so there's our server, it's running, and then I'll run the associated client script for that. So new terminal over here, and I will run Python chat client.py. All right, perfect. So if we look here, we have a message prompt as soon as we log in. So I can say, hi, server. And then that message prompt gets sent over here. And I can say, hi, client, how are you? And we can have this, you know, communication back and forth. However, you know, it's kind of weird that we can only sort of send one message at a time, or at least it seems that way. So I can say, this is my message. And as soon as the client sends it, the message prompt is gone. But what if the client continues to type? So I can say like, I am still typing dot, dot, dot. And then I leave it here. Well, when the uh, server responds to this message, this is my message. The message prompt goes back to the client and then that text appears there, which is kind of weird behavior. So I'll hit enter here and we'll send that message. Now, what if the um, client lost the message prompt? What if we type and we hit enter? So I'm going to say I am typing and hit enter. All right, and I just hit enter. And so now if you look, some weird behavior is happening. So now I'm over here and I don't know where the message prompt is going. So we kind of uh, it looks like we sort of crashed um, the program, which is not not that good. And we also saw, yeah, see, uh, we got a bunch of errors here. We crashed that program. So we definitely don't want that behavior uh, to occur. Um, we also saw, I think at the end of the last video, we talked about this, that we really, we only have two people communicating here, a server and a single client. But what if we wanted three or four or five people communicating? Essentially, what if we wanted more clients? Well, what we're now talking about is more of a chat room rather than a simple chat where multiple people are all together and they can all send messages fluidly uh, or maybe I'll say concurrently at the same time. And this is totally doable and it's something that we are actually going to build. So in order to fix these two issues, we have to in introduce a new module uh, called the threading module. See, uh, our problem comes from the fact that in our previous code, like let's say our, our chat client code, so I'm in here right now, um, um, you know, when we send a message, so if you look, we, we received a message, it was kind of like the, I think we received what the, you are connected to the server, we received that message, and then we sent a message. So we, we, we send a message, we get the message from our, our user, uh, and then we send the message. Perfect. And so once we send that message, we come back up to the top of our while loop here, and we are telling, uh, you know, our socket here that we expect to receive another message. And essentially, um, like this, you know, program sort of hangs until that message essentially comes in, right? The receive method, this method says, hey, wait until we get some data coming through the data stream that we can process as a message. Um, so the tasks of sending, you know, sending here and then receiving and then sending and receiving. They're sort of sequential in our code. And what we want instead is to have both tasks sort of running concurrently or at the same time, um, such that at any time our client script 
is looking to send a message if the user wants to send a message and receive a message if one comes in. And so we want these two processes to run at the same time. And really the threading module can help us accomplish this. Uh, on the server side, we're going to have uh, you know a similar sort of um, situation here. If you look, we uh, accepted an incoming connection, and we accepted the incoming connection outside of the while loop. Well, we want to accept multiple connections. We want to connect to all of them and then receive and send information um, you know to all of the connected uh, clients. However, if you note, know, when I run just my server, and I'll run it inside of here, the server is running. The server hangs right here it's waiting for a connection to come in and only once until that only once that connection comes in that the rest of the program will kind of run so i can't really put this line of code inside of my while loop because it'll hang my program so we're going to have some you know some big issues here However, the threading module is going to allow us to run these different um, portions of our code concurrently or at the same time, right? The sending and receiving of information and the accepting of new clients, we can all run in their own, we'll call them separate threads. So I think that's like a really nice overview and good motivation for what we are going to be doing here. So I'm actually going to close out of these two scripts here and I'm going to make a new file. So file, new file, it's going to be a Python file and I'm going to control Control S and we'll save it. And I'm going to back up one level and I'm going to create a new directory. So we'll call it new directory two and we'll call this terminal chat. Uh, terminal chat room we'll call it. So we're going to make a chat room that exists inside of the terminal. And so this first uh, program that we're going to uh, that we're going to write is just all about the threading module. So I'm going to call this thread uh, intro uh, dot py. Sure. And so we'll just import the first thing that we have to do is import the threading module which is going to help us run programs you know kind of concurrently or at the same time and so I'm going to actually just put some comments here right up at the top to help us understand what is happening so I'm going to say threading allows us to speed up programs by executing multiple tasks at the same time and then we'll say each task will run on its own thread. And then we'll say each thread can run simultaneously and share data with each other. And so that's gonna be, you know, I think really helpful for us for what we want to do if we're gonna try to make a chat room. And so let's just add a little bit more here. We're gonna say every thread when you start, when you start it must do something. So when you start a thread, it has to have um, something that it is going to do. And so we can say that, you know, which we can define with a function. So we'll define some functions. And then when we start a thread, we'll tell the thread, hey, when you start, you're going to run this target function. So our threads will then target these functions that we are going to write. And then lastly, we'll just say when we start the threads, the target functions will be run. All right, so let's put this maybe into uh, practice here. So how are we going to do this? Um, so let's take a look. Let's begin by defining some basic functions. So I'm going to just define some really basic and kind of arbitrary functions. We'll call them function one, function two, and function three. Uh, and each function is just going to do a simple thing. It's going to use a for loop to print out the numbers one, two, or three uh, ten times. So I'll say def function one and I'll say in here uh, for x in range of 10 I guess I'll say for, for i let's do i why not for i in range it doesn't matter but I just like i as my iterable a little bit better we'll say print the word one okay and then we'll say def function two and we'll say for i in range uh, of 10 We'll say print the word two, and I'm putting a space here just for formatting. It'll help us out later. And then I'll say def function three, and we'll say for i in range of 10, print three. All right, so some really um, you know simple simple functions here that are going to help us as we test um, how we can use the threading module. 
So now, as expected, if we call these functions normally, we're so let's just call, we'll call like function one, we'll call function two, and then we'll call function three. So I'm gonna put a comment here. If we call these functions, we see the first function call must complete before the next. Essentially, we'll say that they are executed linearly, right? They're executed in order. So let's just test this out. So we'll call function one, then we'll call function two, and then we'll call function three. And so what we should see is just function one is going to be called, It's and the, the main code is going to hang until that's done, and then function two will be called, the main code will hang until it's done, and then function three will be called. So let's run this, and hopefully we'll see you know one getting printed out Yep, and that's exactly what looks like it's happening, right? So one gets printed out 10 times. When that function is done, the next one starts, two, and then three. Um, perfect. So, and maybe, you know what, I'm going to add, I'll add a little bit here. I'll say, uh, nah, this, this is perfect. I think we're, we're, we're seeing this nicely. Um, so really, we, we've got a nice foundation here set up for ex, uh, kind of exploring what the threading module is going to do to maybe help us run these three functions, not linearly like we're doing here, but rather concurrently. Uh, and I think that this is a good place to stop in this video, and we'll explore that concept uh, in our next video. So I will see you then. Hello, and welcome back. In our last video, we kind of laid the foundation for using this threading module. We wrote three kind of pretty basic functions, function one, function two, and function three, where they just print out the number, the, the words one, two, or three. And we see that when we call them down here, they are executed linearly, right, sequentially. And so that, you know, function one is called, it must complete, and then function two is called and must complete, and then function three is called and it must complete until the uh, program continues. So let's see if we can actually create some threads now to have these functions run concurrently. So what we first need to do is declare the threads using the threading module that we have imported, and then we'll pass in uh, a target. And those targets are going to be the functions that we wrote right here. And it's these functions that will be run when the thread starts. So I'm going to put a little comment down here just for our purposes. We'll say um, we can execute these functions concurrently using threads. We must have a target for a thread. We'll just or a thread. Perfect. So we'll put that in there. So we'll we'll call our first thread T1. And so I'll call, I'm going to create this thread by calling the threading module. And I'll say dot thread. All right. So there's our first thread. And we got to pass in some target for this first thread. So I'll say target is equal to function one. Uh, and if you note here, um, when we write this here, um, we are just using um, the, the function name, right? We're not actually putting the parentheses here because here, we're not actually calling the function. We're just setting it here to be a target. So uh, there is no parentheses here. So let's now define uh, a second thread. So T2 is equal to threading.thread. And then we'll pass in our target. Our target is going to be function 2. And then we'll say T3, our third thread, is threading.thread. And the target of this thread is function 3. All right, perfect. So let's see here, now that we have defined these threads, um, we need to start the thread. So we have defined them, so now we should start the thread. So to start the threads, we just call the thread, so t1.start. All right, and so I'm going to actually comment out uh, these function calls do function one, function two, and function three, and we have t one dot start. So if I run this right now, thread one should start, and it should just print out one. Easy. So if I then do t two dot start, what will happen? So before when we called function one and then function two, we saw function one finished and then function two started. But now with threads, if we run this, you can see we are getting these things running concurrently. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one. So these the these threads are running at the same time. And of course, we can then throw in uh, T3 and start uh, T3. So if we run T3 now, we can see that three is also being printed in here. And so our three functions are being uh, run concurrently rather than sequentially. Awesome. So this is really cool. Maybe this is going to give us a way to run certain parts of our programs, our chat application, like sending and receiving messages at the same exact time. Um, a, a few really important things to note here, though. 
so threads can only be run once. So I've defined my thread T1, and so if I start it here, um, I can't necessarily start or call uh, T1 again. So like if I do T1.start again, let's see what happens. Yeah, I get an error, it's a runtime error. Threads can only be started once. So, uh, you know, if we want to use T1 again, we essentially have to redefine T1. So I'm going to put a comment here to help us understand that. I'll say threads can only be run once. So if you want to reuse, you must redefine. All right, so we'll redefine T1 as threading dot thread, and then we'll pass in our target. And so I'll pass in my target again, function one. All right, perfect. And now I should be able to call t1.start. And then, I don't know, I'll just print a message once it's done. I'll say threading rules. So now if we run this, we should see um, our thread running, our thread running. And then the question is, where will this maybe print statement occur, right? So we're, we started a thread, and so the thread is going to run, and then where does this print statement occur? So let's run this. Oh, did I have a, a mistake here? Let's see. T1 is equal to threading target function 1. Uh, no attribute. Uh, so I think I, I have a mistake here. Let me just see what this says. Function T1 is threading dot Oh, I, I put the word tread. <laughs> let me add a, a thread in here. So uh, let's run this. OK, so let's run this. And so you can see now I'm recalling thread one, and that was not a problem. And you can see here, right, threading rules, it's getting just just printed in there, right? It's just getting thrown right in there. So we're calling our first thread, our second thread, our third thread. We're redefining that thread. Everything is running as fast as it possibly can. Um, however, you know, we might want to pause um, our, our program and wait for the threads to be done before we print maybe this final statement. You know, trying to control when our threads run and when our main code is running is something that we might want to do in the future. So to do this, we can uh, simply kind to pause the program, the main program, until a thread is done. And so if we look here, I will uh, come down here and I'll say, if you want to pause the main program until a thread is done, you can. So let's do that. Let's redefine T1. So we're going to call T1 again. So we have to redefine it, threading.thread. And we'll set a target to be function one. And now what we'll do is we'll call t1.start to start that thread and then to essentially pause the main program until the thread is finished, we can use um, the join method. So I'll take my thread t1 and I'll call dot join and we'll say this pauses the main program until the thread is complete. So now what we should hopefully see is we're going to have, you know, we got lots of threads running. Maybe I will um, comment out some of these threads just for right now. So we'll run our thread, and then we're going to redefine it, run it again. And once that is done, at the end now, we should print uh, threading rules. So let's see if, if this works, if we're pausing it correctly. Uh, and we most certainly are. So the main program was on pause until the thread had finished whatever it was trying to execute. Uh, and then we went back to running the main program. Um, awesome. So I think this is a nice introduction to threading. And we're going to see how we can use this threading module to really help us instill some of the concepts of a of a chat room uh, that we had talked about in our earlier video um, I can't wait to see it in our next video where we begin building that chat room application uh, and we'll see how we can have many people uh, communicate back and forth uh, as many clients attack uh, or connect to a single server so I'll see you in that next video With the fundamentals of threading at our disposal, we now have a way for parts of our programs to run concurrently rather than sequentially. And this is going to be huge for us in trying to make a chat room app. As you can imagine, our server uh, or client scripts are going to have to be listening for connections, receiving information, and sending information all at the same time. We can do just that with threads. So let's start with the basics on both our server and client scripts. So we're going to open up two new files here and save them in our new folder, and I'll call them uh, server.py and client.py. So we'll make a new Python file, and we'll say server uh, side chat room, and I'll save this, 
in we're in our terminal chat room folder and I'll just save this as server uh, server so server.py and we'll make a new file here and we'll make it a Python file and I'll say client side chat room uh, yep perfect and I'll save this and I'll save this as client uh, so it'll be a client.py file uh, excellent so let's start with the uh, with the server side. So over here, we're going to uh, begin by importing the socket and the threading module. So we want both of them in here. So we'll say import socket and comma threading. So that will bring both of those modules in so we have access to their functionality. Um, next, let's define some constant variables that we are going to use across the program. So we'll say here define constants to be used and again I like doing this because then if we want to change these uh, later on all we have to do is just come to the top of our code here uh, and we can uh, create those changes so the first thing that we're gonna need is we're gonna need our local IP address and we'll use that as the host IP so we'll say host IP is equal to socket dot get host by name and then in here we'll pass socket dot get host name alright perfect next we'll need a port address so we'll say host port is equal to uh, what do we let's use one two three four five again we'll say one two three four five um, we'll use an encoder so we'll say encoder is equal to UTF uh, eight and we'll specify a maximum byte size so byte size and again we'll just arbitrarily pick 1024 right now we are not really worried uh, too much about that uh, for for the time being so with those defined, let's now create our server socket, bind it to um, a specific IP address and port address, and then we'll begin listening for incoming connections. And so just like we have been using in the past, we're going to use the IPv4 and TCP protocols for our socket. So we'll put a comment here. We'll say create a server socket, and we will say server socket is what we'll call it, is equal to socket module dot socket and inside of here we're going to pass in our two protocols so socket dot af underscore inet that's ipv4 and then socket dot uh, sock stream there is oh all capitals there is our tcp uh, connection now that we've created this socket we need to bind it uh, to our specific um, IP and port that we've specified here so we'll say alright let's take that socket we just created server socket dot bind and in here we'll pass as a tuple our host IP and our host port alright wonderful and then lastly because um, we are listening we we want an incoming connection we have to listen for that incoming connection so server socket dot listen all right, and so that looks like it is set up perfect. Um, so the last thing that I'm going to do here uh, uh, is create essentially um, a couple of blank lists that we are going to use to store information about all of the various clients that connect to our chat room. So the first thing that we'll store is their socket information. You know how when we when we get a connection, we get the uh, the socket that we are as just connected. So we're going to store those uh, in a list, and then we'll also store the name of the um, maybe the client that's connected so you know whether it's Mike Mary Bob Joe etc so we'll just put a comment here we'll say create two blank lists to store connected client sockets and their names so we'll call our first one client socket list and that'll be initialized as a blank list and then we'll call the next one client name list and we'll initialize that as a blank list as well. Perfect. So these are going to be helpful for us as we kind of move forward in, 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 in building out this program. So while we're here in our server uh, side script, let's outline some of the functions that we're going to need uh, for our chat room server. So you remember, we're going to use threads here. And so threads have to target specific functions. And so we're going to write the function definition here uh, to begin with. So first, we can kind of think of this chat room as different clients talking to each other. I, I'm sorry, we can't think of this chat room as clients talking to directly one another, right? Rather 
together, all clients are going to talk to the server, and then the server will essentially forward messages to the other clients, okay? So the server is going to serve as like an intermediary between all of our connected clients. Messages are going to come into the server, and then the server is going to route those messages to the, their specific location, the specific client that they're supposed to go to. So, you know, this should hopefully make sense because our clients are are not connecting to other clients. They're connecting to the server and every single client is connected to the same server. So our server needs to be able to receive uh, an incoming message. It needs to receive, in fact, it just needs to receive any number of incoming messages and it needs to be able to broadcast or send those incoming messages to all of the clients that are currently connected. So let's outline a function for like each of those functionalities. So first we'll do a uh, broadcast message function which will take in one parameter Parameter, a message that is to be broadcast. So we'll say def broadcast message and it'll take in one parameter a message that is to be broadcast. So we'll put a quick doc string here uh, kind of describing the the functionality of this. We'll say send a message to all clients uh, connected to the server. And then we'll simply just say pass here for right now. We'll worry about writing this um, later on. Uh, next, we'll have a receive message function that will take in one particular parameter. It will take in a client socket that we are trying to receive a given message from. So we'll say def receive message and we'll pass in here a client socket. And so in here, we'll just put a doc string again, receive an incoming message from a specific client and forward the message to be broadcast. So we'll, we'll, we'll add that in here. And for right now, we'll just say pass. So you can imagine, right, if you think about our previous server scripts, um, the server waited for an incoming connection. And when that incoming connection occurred, we accepted it and we got the, the socket of the, the connecting client. So you can imagine every time we have someone connect, we are going to run this receive message function in a thread and we'll pass in the socket that just connected. So we're always going to be listening for incoming uh, you know, messages here. Uh, and lastly, we'll have one that is a connect client. So we will have a, a function here that is going to connect a given client. So and this will take no parameters. So we'll just say def connect client, no parameters in here, but our doc string will say connect an incoming client to the server. So you might imagine that we're gonna have a, a thread where we're always looks, listening for incoming connections. So for right now, we'll just say pass. Um, so this looks pretty good here. We've got our, our functions kind of mapped out nicely. Um, we've got a good setup here uh, for the server script. Let's head over to our client script right now. So I'm just gonna save this and we'll come over to our client script. Uh, inside of our client script, the first thing that we'll do here initially is we will import the socket module and the threading module. All right, so now we have you know access to them. And the next thing that we'll do is we'll define our constants in a uh, similar manner that we did for our server. So I'll just say define constants to be used. And so I'll have a destination IP uh, socket dot get host by name. And then inside of here, I'll do socket dot get host name. All right, perfect. Then we have a destination port, and I'll set that to be one, two, three, four, five. Um, we'll do an encoder, encoder, and we'll set that to be UTF-8. And then we'll specify our byte size just to be 1024, because we're not really too worried about that for right now. All right, good. With all of these defined, let's now create our client socket. Um, so we'll say create a client socket, uh, and we will use IPv4 and TCP again. And so we'll call this client socket is equal to socket, the socket module, and then we'll call socket. So socket.socket. .socket. And then in here, we'll pass in our two protocols. So socket.af underscore inet and socket.socstream. Oh, I think I made that same mistake before. There we go. All capital letters on those things. Now that we've had this, uh, this client socket, we are going to connect to the server socket that is at our specified destination IP and destination port address. So we'll call the client socket, client socket dot connect. We'll call the dot connect method. And inside here, we're going to pass a tuple uh, that specifies where we should connect to. So we'll say destination IP and destination port.
Okay, um, so that I think is pretty great here uh, for the setup. Why don't we just quickly outline what the client needs to do, similarly to what we did with the server. So the client, if you think about it, the client needs to be able to send a message to the server, which is then eventually going to be broadcast for all clients to read. Uh, and then it also needs to be able to receive a message from the server whenever the server is broadcasting another client's message. So really, we just need we need two functions here. So this is easy enough. Let's let's outline this right now. So we'll say def send message, and we'll say no parameters, and we'll just put a doc string here. Send a message to the server to be broadcast to be broadcast. All right, perfect, and we'll pass for right now. And then we'll say def receive message, and we'll put a little doc string in here, receive, and we'll say an incoming message from the server. And we'll say uh, pass here. And I'm going to simply just save this right now. OK, so I think our uh, setups here are complete. So our client uh, socket is created. We've got some functionality we'll work on. The client should be able to send a message from the server, and it should be able to receive a message, or send a message to the server, receive a message from the server. And our server is all set up here, and the server should be able to connect a given client. Once that client is connected, it should listen for incoming messages. It should receive those messages. And then once it gets a message, it is going to broadcast or essentially send that specific message to all other clients connected to the server. So you can imagine if one client types, hey, everybody, how's it going? Every client connected to the server will then get that message. All right, I think this is a great place to stop. We got a nice kind of skeleton here set up uh, that we can kind of fill in in our next couple of videos where we will begin coding this functionality. So I'll see you in that next video.